Hello class. Welcome to today's language arts lesson on Civil War literature. Today we will be reading a book called Almost to Freedom by Vonda Nelson. You will notice today that Vonda Nelson uses a literary tool called voice. All of the characters in today's story talk in the way that they actually would have spoke many years ago. Let's begin. I started out no more than a bunch of rags on a Virginia plantation. Lindy's mama was my maker. Miss Rachel done a fine job putting me together, taking extra time to sew my face on real careful with thread. Embroidery, they call it. I don't have no hair. Miss Rachel just made a bandana from some old cloth and tied it round my head like she wore. I used to think about having me some hair, but now it don't bother me none. When she's done sewing, Miss Rachel give me to her little girl. Lindy hugs me hard and says, Your name be Sally. We gonna be best friends. From that first day, when Lindy be somewheres, I be there with her. I like how Lindy holds me at night and don't even mind when she rolls over me in her sleep. Being Lindy's doll baby is a right important job. When Lindy and Miss Rachel pick cotton, I be there too. Lindy ties me round her waist with a rope. The knot's kinda loose and after a while I fall to the ground. Sally, you getting yourself all dirty, Lindy says. Now you stay put. Miss Rachel wipes sweat from her brow and shows Lindy how to tie me on tight. The overseer hollers, get up there, like he's talking to a couple of horses. He's riding over carrying his whip. Miss Rachel and Lindy quick start picking again. The work be hard, but the long days seem a mite easier with everybody singing. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. Come sundown, we sit round and listen to stories about little critters fooling big ones and about slaves outsmarting masses. These is the best times because there's lots of laughing and singing. But when folks start talking about something called freedom, their faces turn serious in the firelight. Some say you can buy freedom, but it's so dear we never heard of anybody ever could. Seems the only other way to get it is to run away to a place called North. The way they talk, freedom must be a good thing. But after what happened to Lindsay's papa, I ain't sure. Strangers chain Mr. Henry in a wagon and take him away. Massa sold him down the river, is what folks say, because he tried to get freedom. Miss Rachel, she cried and cried. Lindy, too. And she hugged me so hard, I think my insides will bust out my seams. After that, Miss Rachel sits up at night looking at the sky. She holds Lindy, and Lindy holds me. She rocks us singing, Steal away, steal away home. I ain't got long to stay here. One day, Lindy gets whipped by the overseer. She didn't do nothing but ask Massa's son how to spell her name. Well, the boy tells on Lindy, and Massa comes out and says, We'll make sure you people forget all about reading and writing. He makes everybody stop working to watch. Eyes tied to Lindy, but when the whipping starts, I slip out and fall. My face is on the ground, but I hear the overseer's black snake whip. I hear Lindy screaming. I hear Miss Rachel crying. And when it's over, I see the cuts on Lindy's back. While she's doctoring Lindy, Miss Rachel whispers a prayer. Lord, don't let Massa be selling my baby like he done her papa. Later, Lindy sets me on a stump. Her cheeks wet with tears. Someday, Sally, we won't be doing what Massa say. We be going to freedom. I'm thinking, Lord have mercy.
One night, Lindy's sleeping beside me like always, and there's whispering, and Lindy's getting her clothes on. The sun ain't awake. The field workers is always up for dawn, so I don't think much of it. Miss Rachel's all dressed and telling Lindy, right now, but hush. Lindy grabs me up and ties me to her. The way Lindy's heart's beating, I know something important's happening. Linda takes Miss Rachel's hand, and we sneak out behind our shack and run into the night. I know I ain't running, but it feels like I am. It feels like I'm flying. Branches slap us along the way like they scolding us, warning us to go back. But Miss Rachel don't pay no mind, just keeps running. My feet, Mama, there's burrs, Lindy says. I know, baby, Miss Rachel whispers, but we gotta keep on. We run for a while, then hide under the brush. Then we run some more. Lindy's breathing hard, but says, Don't be worrying, Sally. Mama say we be with Papa soon. Soon don't come real soon. But sure enough, Mr. Henry's waiting by the river. He hugs Miss Rachel. Then he lifts Lindy into the air and me with her. Papa, Lindy says laughing, but Mr. Henry covers her mouth and holds her close. Quiet now. We gotta get to the boatman and cross over. We hurry along the bank to where the man is waiting with his skiff. Without one word, we climb in. The night is dark as in inside a possum. It's dead quiet except for the sound of the boatman pushing, pushing, pushing his oars. My face soaks up little splashes of water as we glide along. On the other side, Miss Rachel squeezes the boatman's hand. Lindy's papa leads us through the night woods. We run and hide, run and hide, till we come to a house with a lantern glowing soft in the window. We crouch behind the barn. Lindy's papa calls out, Woo! Woo! Like a hooty owl. The lantern goes out. A white man wearing eyeglasses steps out of the dark. He motions us to follow him to the back of the house. Inside the kitchen, a woman with silver hair opens the door to a storeroom. The man lifts a rug, takes some boards from the floor, and uncovers a ladder leading into pitch darkness. It's small and mat chilly, the man says, but it's the safest place we got. He hands Miss Rachel a lantern. I've put blankets and water down there, and I'll get you some food, the woman says. Much obliged, ma'am, Mr. Henry says, and he climbs down the ladder. The woman hands Lindy a pillow. Miss Rachel's friend who worked in the big house told us about pillows, but I never seen one. The secret room is tiny, but not much smaller than the shack Massa had us in. Miss Rachel spreads two blankets on the dirt floor, and everybody except me takes some water. Lindy lays me on the pillow. It's the softest thing, like a cloud from heaven. The silver-haired woman hands down a stew pot, bowls, some bread and cheese. Then she closes up the floor. Miss Rachel serves up supper. Nobody talks, too tired, too scared. They sop up the last of their stew with bread. Sleep now, Papa says to Lindy and me. Lindy whispers she needs to make water. Mr. Henry points to a bucket in the corner. Grippy be too dangerous. After, Lindy holds me close like always. She lays her head on that pillow and smiles. Not Sally, she whispers. We almost a freedom. If I coulda, I'd have smiled too. Seems like we just get to sleep and Miss Rachel is shaking Lindy. Come on, baby, quick. Why? Lindy asks. 
Slave catchers, Mr. Henry whispers, blowing out the lantern. Lindy ties me round her waist. I guess sleep style still has her, cause the knot ain't tight. Miss Rachel tucks some bread and cheese in her apron, and she and Lindy follow Mr. Henry up the ladder. They're scrambling fast, and I feel myself slipping. Then I'm falling, falling till I hit that dirt floor. Lindy calls my name. The silver-haired woman is closing up the floor. Lindy, wait! But you can't hear me, cause I ain't got no voice. The board shut out the light. When the floorboards open again, sunlight shines in. The silver-haired woman comes down the ladder. There you are, she says, picking me up. Your little mama didn't want to leave you. She straightens my dress. There just wasn't time. She sets me on a blanket and tucks it round me. Sleep tight, she says, and carries the lantern and privy bucket up the ladder. Then she closes the floor. If I could have made tears, then blankets would have been wet clean through. I want Lindy. But I know she ain't coming back. Can't. The loneliness swallows me up. I give a lot of time to thinking about Lindy and her folks, where they was, and if they ever got to freedom like they was wanting. I give a lot of time to praying they did, and I give a lot of time to grieving. Grieving for myself. I wish the silver-haired woman would come, but she don't. Nobody comes. After a spell, I'm thinking maybe slave catchers is watching this house. Maybe the hiding place ain't safe. Maybe I'll lay right here for the rest of my days. By and by, a mouse scurries over my face and into a corner. I was glad to have the company. I pass the time listening to Ms. Mouse make herself a nest and raise her youngins. I'm sorry when they finally go, as I get to feeling lonely again. I get to thinking that I best stop hoping. Then one day, praise the Lord, the board's being moved. Somebody's coming down the ladder. If I had a flesh and blood heart, it would have been pounding like Lindy's that night we run off. I see light from a lantern and a woman wrapping up a little girl in a blanket. The child shivering, more scared, I think, than cold. Her eyes look tired and tearful. The woman picks me up and says, Willa, darling, this must be the dolly the missus was mentioning. She blows the dust off my face and holds me closer to the lantern. Not if fine stitching. Can I keep her? The girl asks. Her mama nods and Willa hugs me so hard I think my insides will bust out my seams. Two men come down the ladder. They talk about going north to freedom. Their face is serious in the lamplight. When they settle in for sleeping, Willa holds me in her arms and whispers, You name Belinda. We gonna be best friends. Belinda. I like that. Sounds like Lindy. My face don't change, but I smiles inside, remembering the crackling of the straw mattress when Lindy's roll over me in her sleep. I sure do miss her, but I's mighty glad to be Willa's doll baby. It's a right important job. And there's an author's note at the end of the story that I'm going to read. I was inspired to write Almost to Freedom during a visit to the Museum of International Folk Art in Santa Fe, New Mexico. There, a display of black rag dolls from the 1800s and 1900s immediately caught my attention. The majority of the dolls were entirely handmade from scrap cloth, my husband read from the museum guidebook. A few were said to have been found in one of the hideouts of the Underground Railroad, suggesting their use by black children. As I admired the exhibit, my husband leaned in close and whispered, There's a story in that. Yes, I thought, if only those dolls could talk. The Underground Railroad was most active between 1830 and the beginning of the Civil War. This was not a real railroad with trains that traveled beneath the earth. It was a secret network of courageous people, black and white, 
who worked together to help slaves steal away to freedom in northern and western states and to Canada. No one person knew the entire system of escape routes and safe houses, and some details remain unknown to this day. Dedicated individuals like the boatman, the silver-haired woman, and her husband risked much to be part of this movement. Runaways faced even greater dangers. Although some were transported by ship, wagon, or train, most traveled on foot through woods, swamps, fields, and rivers, often pursued by slave catchers with dogs. Some slaves reached freedom. Others were caught, returned to their masters, and punished severely. Many captured runaways were whipped savagely or sold, never to see their families again. Some were fitted with iron collars, painfully shackled, or had their toes cut off to keep them from running away again. Still, thousands of slaves escaped through the Underground Railroad. And I hope you enjoyed our story today. <laughs>